might be um, heading out. He just came and gave a quiet word to Gert then is here, but it seems like he's going to be heading out. So we're probably going to be staying in the tent this afternoon to stay nice and dry. Um, so we will probably do some videos and some all sorts of interesting and fun entertainment here in the tent. So we do thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for your questions and comments. It's been most entertaining. We're looking forward to an afternoon of tea and relaxed dryness here in the tent. But don't forget to tune in to the live safari coming to you right now. This is on safari. See you soon. Goodbye. Features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Welcome, welcome to another Sunset Safari. You are live with us here at Amakala Private Game Reserve in the very southern parts of the Eastern Cape where the Red Heart will be able to start chasing each other like headless chickens. Hello, hello, my name is Eric, joined by Morgan behind the camera and this afternoon we are going to be your eyes and ears on a very, very windy, 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 windy day. Overcast. It's definitely much warmer than it was this morning, thank goodness for that. However, the clouds have not disappeared and the wind is still present. But that is fine, we will deal with the elements this afternoon. And uh, we've decided that we're going to have a look around our most northwestern part of the reserve, which we call Amma North, or also known as the Northern Territory. What is going on here? So we've got a very large herd of uh, red heart beast in front of us. A massive breeding herd. This is probably actually, yeah, this is probably the biggest breeding herd that we have on Amakala. Um, it's probably about 30, 30 to 40 strong here. And uh, not exactly too sure why they are all so skittish. It could possibly be the wind. But uh, before we went live, they were probably about 200 meters to the east on another field on a slope. And then as the countdown started, <laughs> they dashed across the road. And uh, now they look like they want to start galloping off over the hillside there now i must remember you must remember this is a live and interactive show and your questions and comments do help us and we'd love to hear from you so you can do so by on the wild earth app if you're watching there you can register and make some comments there in the live stream if that doesn't work you can also use youtube where you can also get involved in the conversation and the action uh, in the comment section below there then then there's always twitter using the hashtag wild earth tag sign and uh, oh, you can make some questions make some comments like i said we do love to hear your questions and we love your comments so please do get involved K9 girl, good afternoon, good afternoon, welcome. We hope you enjoy our sunset safari this afternoon and we hope that it is action packed. And uh, of course we are not alone this afternoon. It is raining in Duma, so I'm not too sure how Steve and James are going to maneuver around this, but if they do go out, we have Wendy and Steve, well, sorry, Steve <laughs> and Claret on Wendy, and then on Rusty, we have James and PK. 
and then in the in the offices in the manning the big screens we have jared i'm not too sure who else is in the office with him goodness gracious the wind is not pleasant at all i definitely think the wind does have something to do with the skittishness of these uh Red heart of beers. Then there's a black wilder beers just waltzing his way through the scene here. You know, a bit of photo bombing. He was seen earlier bashing a bush. Cheetahs and other animals. I'm also glad Morgan's feeling a lot better than what he was feeling. I can't. I obviously can't do this on my own. Where are you off to, black wilder beers? in such a hurry well not in a hurry i mean he's he's just come walking across and he hasn't stopped like i wonder but um yeah quite often uh black wildebeest you know, territorial bulls what they'll do is they'll make these little kind of like a dust pan uh craters or dust beds where they will actually roll around in a lot of the dust there um but often they actually defecate in those craters and then they roll around in that and then they go attack bushes and rub up against bushes and obviously the scent of their feces uh gets uh, rubbed up against whatever bush it is and uh, that's pretty much how they mark their territories um, pretty interesting. I know um, I've seen Blaisbok do it before as well because they also also seen sitting in craters of their own feces. These red heart beers are all over the place today. They look like they've got a bit of a spring in their step, but you can also see that they're a bit uneasy. Jelly B, I think I don't want to speak too soon, but I feel the rut has already started with the heart to beers as well. Um, we obviously heard. I think it was yesterday, the um, Impala that came tearing past us, or he was actually below us and he was grunting. But I've also seen some red heart to be just going at it, um, constantly fighting with each other, and those will be the males. And then while we were watching some rhinos the other day, we also heard some red heart to be just not too far away that were also having a little bit of a tussle with each other. Um, only reason we know that is because we heard the sound. I mean, the sound of the horns hitting each other was very, very, very loud. But, um, yeah, I, I, I imagine, because not all, not all antelope's horns are incredibly strong. You know, there are the, the, the odd males that will have a horn where one of the horns might be a little bit weaker than the other and sometimes you can actually end up having unicorns so antelope with only one horn slowly starting to move down now and they're going into it's not really a dip but it is a dip um, you know once upon a time this definitely could have been a an old well a tributary maybe could have been a little stream down here long 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 ago But um, yeah, this is a very typical, a very typical herd side for herd herd size. Sorry, very typical herd size for red hartebeest. It can normally be seen in their numbers like this, and 
Obviously, on Amakala, we are very not limited on our spot. We are limited on our space. So we can't just have the biggest of big herds. So we've obviously got to watch the numbers of specifics. And, you know, because we don't want to overpopulate this area. And then there's no grass for anybody to eat. And we do have to watch the numbers. But uh, yeah, it's very nice to see such a large group of animals like such. Yeah, I think red heart bear is probably the animal that we have the most of. Them and warthogs, I should say. Oh. So, you obviously can't see it, but um, that black wildebeest that came waltzing across the screen, he actually made his way down to what looks like three males, or what looked like three males, sitting together, well not sitting together, feeding together, some sub-adults, and now he's just been seen chasing one of those bulls, and that bull is still running. He stopped chasing it, but it hasn't stopped running. <laughs> And this could possibly be him trying to push one of these guys out of his territory. Helen, wow. So we're all in this together. It would seem you are experiencing it in the UK, the whole of South Africa, well not all of South Africa, but a lot of South Africa is receiving this horrible, horrible, windy, wet, rainy weather, uh, especially oh, the wind. Um, there's been actually, a, we were talking about it, or well, Morgan told me about it earlier, a truck was blown off the road, not just outside of Cape Town. So that is proof that this, I mean, the wind is incredible. I can feel my hat is about to blow off my head. But um, unpleasant, unpleasant. But it's fine. At least it's not raining. Wind is one thing. Rain is another. The two together are a nightmare. So oh, touch wood. Just to make sure, because it is. It was supposed to have rained a little bit today, and it hasn't dropped a drop. So a little bit worried where this rain has got to. Good afternoon and welcome to this end of the very cheerful Sunday Sunset Safari where BK, Mboka Mosa Malinga and I have come out to brave the elements and uh, you will notice that Stivovo remains in the tent. Now that is because his, well my, our vehicle Rusty uh, was broken basically and we couldn't come out and so we've come out in Wendy which is Steve's car. And I actually think that Steve has sabotaged a vehicle, knowing that I would have to take out whatever car was available because he was in the tent. And so Steve is now snug and warm in the tent. He has prepared a couple of interesting elephant behavior clips and various other things to talk to you about. And I'm sure that he will have tea and Sunday coffee and whatever else he wants to have. And uh, he and Kharat will be very happy there in the tent while Boko Moso Malinga and I are out here braving what can only be described as a deeply foul cloud that has settled over the low felt. And indeed, if uh, uh, Eric is to be believed, it has settled over the entire country. I, I feel sorrier for Eric than I do for myself, and that is difficult uh, because he is dealing with the Eastern Cape wind, whereas we are not. And that is a small mercy. Now, our plan this afternoon, other than to complain bitterly for the best part of three hours, is to head down towards the dam in front of our camp, called Gari Dam, or Vuyatela Dam, or Juma Dam, depending on who you are. And we're going to see if we can find the lionesses of the Talamatis, who were there about, at about, I think it was, five to two they walked past the zoomies on the dam cam picked them up and they walked past there so we'll go and see if we can find them 
I think the chances are slim given the weather and the, the f they seem to have headed into some thick areas but we'll head down that way and see what we can find. Oh, lucky old you. Lucky old you, Annalie. You say, good afternoon everybody, warm tea for safari. Uh-huh, well, nice for some. <laughs> and then, before we move on from this position, because what we really want to do is to get as far south as we can as quickly as possible and then drive very slowly back towards the north so that the wind is behind us. We're just going to have a look at the flowers there. We had some good flowers this, after, this morning, quite common varietals, nothing particularly outlandish, but uh, interesting nevertheless. And we've got some yellow flowers there, that's them, and they belong to the monkey pod. And I keep saying Senna paticiana, but I'm beginning to think it's Senna something else, but it is a Senna species of some description. There we go, some yellow flowers. We had a butylon, we had the devil's thorn, we had Sphidamnocarpus, we had a few others. Oh, Rhino, you spotted some other flowers, red flowers behind the impala. I can only assume, yep, yeah, that they are Zinnia piana. And they are, or the red star Zinnia, and Zinnia peruviana comes from. Everybody together? Ready? Yeah, that's right, Peru. So it's a, a sort of naturalized plant, so it's an exotic, but it isn't an invasive exotic, so it doesn't sort of take over areas. It does grow quite a lot on disturbed sites, and this would be described as a disturbed site because it's been artificially cleared by human beings. But it's not invasive, it's quite pretty. Zinnia peruviana, the red star zinnia. Good one. That's not bad. Return of flowers for the autumn. Okay, BK, shall we move on? You know the rule about how long you stay out on game drive in the rain. Do you know that rule? The rule used to be that um, I take my guests out and the rule was that if your underpants got wet, it was time to turn around and go home. Okay, so you let me know when that happens and we'll go home. Let's go across to Steve, whose underpants are definitely going to remain entirely dry for the next three hours. Thanks, James. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, indeed. My underpants are going to stay dry. James, you could have asked me for my wet weather pants before you went out. You came in, had a quiet word with Khat just before, and then you left without a word to me. I would have given you my wet weather pants. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve. I'm joined by Gert on camera, and we are indeed here in the tent. We are carrying on from the On the Safari show, and we find ourselves nice and warm and snug. Even though I've got my gumboots on, I was ready to go out and uh, delve into the weather. But uh, James, his vehicle is not performing, and so he's taken mine. I had no choice in the matter. It's fine. I do have some tea. We have some snacks. And uh, we have some wonderful discussions this afternoon. So we're going to try and watch the show as well and delve into what Eric is doing, delve into what James is doing, see what they have. And at the same time, keep the theme going that I was talking about during On Safari and have for the last couple of days. I've been getting a lot of interest from many of you, the viewers, about elephant behavior and touching on how do we understand these different zones. And um, on the On Safari show, right over here, I had a drawing which um, Dark Man Lover earlier said was a remarkable drawing. Thank you, Dark Man Lover. Now, essentially, on any given day, everybody, here is an elephant. Now, that could be an elephant bull. That could be a breeding herd. That could be a lion. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that you need to understand that every single animal behaves differently on any given day. You don't know what has happened to it five minutes before. You don't know what happened to it yesterday. You don't know if it's injured. You don't know if it's been hunted. You don't know if it's hungry. You don't know if it's got babies. You don't know. So each situation needs to be handled in a way that is respectful for the animal. And potentially, if you have people with you, respectful for the people that you have. And is ethical in every single regard. Okay, so here, this example is me walking. It's amazing. I'm a very small fellow. And uh, I'm walking, and from a distance, I see an elephant. 
Now what do I do? I use my binoculars and I have a look and I see what kind of elephant. Safari level or solar eclipses affect what the behavior of animals? I don't know. It might do. Um, there's just this shift in the daylight time or the daylight light. It could. I don't know. I think we'll have to be out and about on Monday tomorrow to observe it. But what I'm going to do, and this is something if you're a, a new person to the wilderness, if you're a new guide, if you're a, a person who's interested in exploring the Kruger National Park in your own vehicle, uh, this doesn't have to be walking on foot. This can be every single situation. Try and observe a few guidelines about how best do we approach animals out in the wild places. And we don't want them to react to us. Okay, that's not what we're aiming for. But if you don't understand an animal's behavior, it might very well react to you. Okay, so from a distance, what is it? In this case, we've got an elephant bull. Okay, very good. I can see the elephant bull. What's going on with the wind direction? This is if I'm on foot specifically. What's going on with, with the, the, the landscape? Is it in the open? Is it dense vegetation? What are the characteristics of where I am? And uh, cool, from a distance, the animal is very, very relaxed. It doesn't even know that I'm here. But what's gonna happen is as I drive closer or walk closer, you're gonna hit a line. You're going to hit a line that is going to fluctuate depending on the day. And at that exact line, that animal is going to do something. Something is going to change in the animal's behavior, which is going to show that you've reached the alert zone. The animal's going to stop feeding, or it's going to lift its trunk, or its tail's going to go stiff. Something is going to change. The animal's become aware of you, and it's going, hang on, what's happening? Okay, now at this point... Invariably, in a vehicle, one foot, you stop and you observe. What does the animal do next? Now, if in two seconds, three seconds, ten seconds, the animal carries on feeding and the tail starts moving again and the head starts flapping and carries on eating, okay, the alert zone has been crossed and the animal's okay. Now you can continue on and you're going to hit a line in the ether that that animal is going to change its behavior once again. And that is essentially the animal indicating to you that you are coming too close. It's either going to lift its head up. I'm talking about elephants specifically. Its body language is going to change to the point where its body structure, the way it lifts its head, the way it lifts its trunk, the tail is going to go stiff. It might stop feeding. It might smash a branch. It might trumpet. At that point, that essentially is going to be a warning zone. Russell, I'm glad that you're enjoying this. I think it's really nice to understand these aspects. So at this point here, everybody, and the animal is warning you, what is the best thing to do when someone warns you? You stop, right? You absolutely stop. And if you're over there and you switch your car off, and the animal reacted, it should calm down again in a few minutes and then you don't go anywhere closer. But you shouldn't really be crossing that line. You should be staying in the alert zone to the point where you, you see the animal is starting to change its behavior again, and you stop. Five meters before that line, before the animal does something, you switch the car off and you stop and you watch. And you'll see the animal will immediately start to relax again. But once you've hit the warning zone, the animal's going to react in a way. Okay, it's happened now. But if you continue forward and this intimidation that they've done, this noise that they've made, this tree that they've smashed over, the trumpet that they've done, and all of the subtle or massive body languages that this elephant is going to do has been ignored. What's going to happen when you hit this red line? The critical zone. Well, the elephant's either going to run away in a very, very dramatic way, or it's going to run towards you and potentially injure yourself, your vehicle, or the people you're with because you didn't pay attention to the changes in its behavior over what can be 100 meters, what can be 30 to 40 meters. Well, we are bumbling along what appears to feel like the great savannah, the grasslands of Africa. And this is just one of the corners of this I'm a waste. Oopsie daisy. 
completely forgot to turn the radio on. We were trying to communicate with some of the other guides. But it actually, it's quite nice. So we're going with the wind. And uh, <laughs> it's actually quite pleasant doing this. Obviously, we can't obviously do this the whole drive, but we can definitely try as much as possible. And uh, well, we're having a good scan for our three amigos. Uh, so apparently they are somewhere in this area. So that is what we're looking for. I'm sure that is definitely on the cards. I haven't seen her in quite some time. Uh, we definitely got to put some time aside to get across to I'm a North, as we call it, where Pumalele is, and see what the progress is with her uh, her cubs. I'm sure they must be fairly biggish now. Uh -huh. Look what I found, look what I found. <laughs> Ooh, hello. Look at these, look at these. We've found them. The three amigos, or well, one of them at least. The other two are just further on. But, uh, yeah. isn't this special? Been a good while since we last saw these fellows. Definitely a full belly, or not a full belly, but a full-ish belly. And that means that there may have been a, a carcass that they would have been feeding on soon, well, earlier. They are passed out and you know this is typical behavior for cheetahs on days like today when the wind is so strong and you know and cheetahs like to be out in the open uh in the grasses and uh, obviously this is not the best for when it's very very windy you can see there's the other two lying over there but Obviously, when you're in the long grass like this, you just put your head flat and sort of escape the wind a little bit. Not completely, but it's better than being on a flat surface, a very, very, very flat surface with no grass and the wind blowing over it. Deep breaths. They have not moved since I turned off the road. <laughs> They are lying flat in a deep sleep. Well, oops. I'm glad that we have found the three amigos there at Amakala. For those of you who just rejoined us, we have found the three amigos at Amakala, but they are doing what any sensible human being or animal is doing in this weather. They are fast asleep, snuggling, staying warm. I, I'm shortly going to stop and take a photograph of what's going on behind me, because BK has basically set himself up in much the same way that Steve has. And while I am out here in the elements, <laughs> BK is in a stuffy little tent behind me. <laughs> well, he has to suffer my driving, so I suppose that's that's small consolation for him. African sunset, that is palpably untrue. You say that there's no such thing as bad weather, only the wrong clothes. 
Uh, I disagree. I think there's definitely bad weather. I've experienced bad weather. I, th this is not the worst weather I've experienced, but I've definitely experienced bad weather. And I'll tell you this, African Sunset, you're obviously not from South Africa if you say that, because the, you cannot buy the right clothes in South Africa. I, I would agree with you. I mean, my sister lives in England, and because it's generally foul there weather-wise, she goes, she goes out rain or shine with a small baby, well, not small, but two-year-old, and they, they don't have a choice. If they want to go outside, they need to dress accordingly, and that's fine. They've got proper waterproof clothes, boots and all sorts of things that can cope with the elephant elements you got to sell your house if you want to buy that sort of clothing here in south africa here we've got things like dry max which um are dry for about three and a half milliseconds after you get into the rain we have the ponchos that i described yesterday smelling of rancid custard and it was waterproof as tea bags so I, I think maybe my attitude to that comment, African Sunshine, is born of the fact that you cannot buy the right clothes in South Africa for when it's wet. And it is because our weather is generally so very good. And it means that we have a collective, collective amnesia. As soon as it goes from bad to good, we forget that it was ever bad, and we forget how to compensate for bad weather. We have elephant tracks on the road, must be fresh, because it's raining and they would have been wiped out if they were not fresh. They went up this road here, so I think we should follow. Maybe they will lead us. Oh, I can hear them. They might actually be right next to us. Did you hear them? must be right here. Peace to you. You would say you would say you would love to see Marips, the male leopard, or Nena, the male leopard. I would also love to see both of those cats. And we will attempt to find kitties. I'm sure I heard elephants. I'm not going mad, am I? No, you're not. You did hear them. Oh dear. But I thought I heard them around there. Let me turn down that way. Yes, <laughs> important not to miss the first zone of behavior. I added another zone to the behaviors between death and critical. And that, that's the zone in which you utter expletives. BK, I feel like I'm going insane. I de we definitely heard them. But where? So the tracks went up there, but I thought I heard them here. Let's just have a little listen. Well, I can't hear them anymore. We go back up where the tracks were going. If they're nervous, they will go completely silent and hide from us, which is not nice of them. Let's attempt to stay out of the critical zone, shall we? or the dead zone. We don't want to be in either of those zones. Jackie, darling, I don't think anthrax is particularly prolific amongst any species in South Africa at the moment. I don't think there's been an outbreak for some time. Um, amongst elephants specifically, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you. I really don't know. Quite difficult to reverse when you can't see behind you. 
Oh, there they are. They've just popped out. There. You can't see them because you're in your comfortable little house. Good grief. Okay. Right, we're going to see an elephant, everybody. I don't think it's got anthrax. Anthrax, remember, is a problem when the weather is very dry. <clears throat> and we haven't had a drought for a long time. Let's just have a quick look at this elephant's bum because I think he's a young bull and I think he was the one that called possibly nervous because he's behind the rest of the herd now I am going to tell you that if this enthusiasm of rain continues we will have to pack this in after a while because we don't want to wet what equipment we have left. Paul, you want to know if I think Rusty is in protest at his imminent forced retirement. I think Rusty is so grateful for his imminent forced retirement that I, I really think that he had put in a special extra effort to come out just so that he could go out with a bang. And I'm interested that you call Rusty a he because I also call Rusty a he, but I think you and me, Paul, might be, might be in the minority there. You also call him a he. Yeah, Rusty's definitely a boy car. Wendy's a girl. There's our one elephant. Right. I think, Jared, if you don't mind, we'll just hang with this Ellie for a little while if he's coming towards us, simply because um, I don't know what else we're going to see. And in this weather, we're going to have to sit exactly where we are. We can't drive with the rain coming down this, this hard because it will come into the car. We've got our backsides faced. Yeah, this is definitely a young bull who's quite interested in us. And I suspect the rest of the herd is grazing just up ahead. He's a bit bored. Let me reverse slightly, BK. <laughs> Never too late. You want to know if they open their eyes wide when they're alert? Um. I don't think wider than normal. Never too late. Oh, jeez. Okay, I'm afraid we can't move from here. We're going to have to wait for the squall to go by. We've had to face our backsides into the wind. The elephant has uh, disappeared. Um, so, Jarrett, when you're ready... Oh, here, hang on. Wait, 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 wait. Look, there are a whole lot more. Please don't try and come and kill us. I really can't reverse. I can't reverse. I can't see anything. Thanks very much. She's been digging. Ooh, I think she might be the mother of the bull who was looking at us. She's giving him what for. Hello, chaps. Amazing. Some bottoms. BK, you might win an award for this shot. Called Combretum with Elephant. Right, while we watch that elephant disappear, remember tonight at 7 o'clock we will be doing a town hall with Andre and me. This is an important town hall. We'll give you an update on the fundraise we've done. And I just need to tell you that the fundraise has gone really very well for us. 
Um, we've got obviously the hundred and thirty thousand dollars that a very kind and obviously fairly well healed viewer has uh, guaranteed for us and in addition to that we've gathered around about a hundred and eighty thousand dollars and if we could push that to 200 by the end of tonight that really would be absolutely amazing it'll give us between four and six months of runway depending on our cost model and our restructuring and that will give us the time to find a corporate sponsor. We hate sticking the begging bowl out. We've done it very often and we've always been rescued. So a big thank you to all of you who have donated. If you would still like to, um, wildearth.tv forward slash donate. It will be hugely helpful. And if you would like to sign the petition to get multi-choice to come to the come to the party you can join 16,000 others who have signed a variety of petitions to encourage multi-choice to pay us for our content and we'll tweet the link for that petition now still sitting here with our three amigos not much movement has been done this one lifted his head and then he pulled it straight back down and um, yeah, like I said I was noticing that their bellies are fairly full not very very full so I'm sure that they were quite fat at some stage but um, yeah a fair amount of digestion has been done and I think that that killed it they made must have been done either early this morning or sometime last night yesterday afternoon we don't see it anywhere near here um, not exactly too sure where where it is but uh, what we do know is cheetah don't generally stay around their carcasses they move off fairly fairly quickly away obviously because the smell of the carcass attacks unwanted attention that they don't need from scavengers and sometimes even other predators now they've been here for quite some time Charlotte indeed a cheetah treat very feeling very very lucky and spoiled today these uh, three amigos have been on this part of the reserve uh, just under a week now. When we started, oh, when we started broadcasting uh, at the beginning of the week, they were still on the main reserve, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yeah, I think two days or three days of us being here, and they slipped past us. So they've been here ever since and then obviously it rained after that and the tunnel has been full of water I highly doubt they're going to be crossing through there any time soon uh, with the weather that we've got forecasted for the next week or two I think another thing that we can be grateful for is the fact that some of the soil is still damp. So there's no real like dust to dust in the air. And that would be a big, big problem on a day like today. With the wind that we are having, there'd be dust everywhere. Um, it may actually sometimes disturb our sightings a little bit, but uh, <laughs> yeah. We are doing fine at the moment. Now, those two that are in front of us over there that you can see, they, the head of the one furthest away from us, that will be on the left-hand side of the screen. I watched them put it in. I 
Alaska Safari, what we do basically is we will try and we will come to a conclusion as to how many of these animals need to be moved off and then what we'll do is we'll set up a game capture um, be it blinds be it catching them with nets or uh, just darting and darting and putting them into game trailers but yeah, we, what we will do is we'll sell our animals to other reserves that probably need them more than what we do um, and that, yeah, that's basically what happens when there's an overpopulation of something and that time of the year is actually coming up pretty soon so they're going to start doing their counting they're going to do their, um, what is it called, the census of uh, all the animals in Amakala and then from there they will work on how many animals, well, which pop, which animals or which species has too many and which species actually has quite a few to get to before they get to too many. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so winter is generally the time where they do uh, a lot of the game captures and uh, it's quite important basically because in winter it doesn't get as warm as it does in summer and when you dart an animal or you sedate it the animal has now lost its ability to regulate its temperature properly which means that if it overheats they die and quite often that does that does happen with game captures and it's it's nobody's fault at the end of the day um you know it's it's just how the animal reacted to the to the uh the medicine if you will so yeah cooler days better times for game capture and that's how we control our animals on amakala so for instance if there's too many red heart bears say for instance we have what 500 red heart to be us, then they might try and catch a few of them and either sell them or give them to neighboring reserves or reserves that would like to buy they'll go to an auction I actually find game auctions quite quite good fun watching people put a lot of money on animals and it's actually quite interesting to see, you know, how animals get bought. And where they come from. You know, at auctions you hear all sorts of good things about these animals and all of them trying to, you know, promote them to 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 the buyers to get them to that point where they cannot resist not buying the animal. A little bit of adjusting there. Now we can really see that bed. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's a big beddy. <laughs> All right, we're going to send you over to the, I quote, nice, warm, toasty Steve in the tent. Warm and toasty. With some warm tea, indeed. Sorry, that was cheeky of me. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We've just uh, tried to investigate. There's a bit of a smell of, of, of burning plastic, which is never good when uh, you're in the wet. Well, I'm sure we'll be okay. So, anthrax. James has talked about anthrax before. Um, anthrax is a very common sort of disease bacteria that's found in the soil. And uh, it commonly affects domestic um, animals, sheep, goats, horses, and many, many wildlife. Um, it has been known to affect elephant. Um, we found a dead elephant before that has been deduced that it was anthrax that killed them. But generally it affects very heavily cloven-hoofed animals such as kudu, impala, and the like. And uh, they reckon anthrax originated from Egypt to Mesopotamia uh, back in the day, ancient Egypt times. And they even reckon that anthrax was responsible for the fifth plague that wiped out all the domestic animals, the sheep, the goats, the pigs, and the cows. So that's kind of like a thought. But anthrax is a spore that lives in the soil and uh, 
can be dug up, especially as James was talking about earlier, after very dry conditions, can live in the soil for quite some time. And when it gets released, it infects an animal, goes into their system and is often transferred by their saliva. And if the animal gets fed upon, as well as if um, you mess with the carcass and you get it on your hands, and it can infect you quite badly. And it generally leads to quite a, a, an uncomfortable, or what you'd probably think of as a savage death in an animal. Um, quite often what the animal does is that it, it, it dies, but its whole body spasms as it kicks and it kicks and its whole neck goes backwards. And you'll find on the ground, this is quite a characteristic feature because when you find a dead animal, it's very important that you know there's certain symptoms. Okay, cool, it's a dead animal. Try not to touch it. If you find an animal that's been thrashing, legs have been thrashing on the ground, you can see the disturbance and the neck is thrown back almost as if the spinal cord wants to break and there's the discharge out of the nose. That is a very, very good telltale sign that there is anthrax. And um, I used to take um, blood samples back in the day. I haven't for a long time now, but you just get a little blood sample of that. Make sure you use gloves. Get a little smear on the glass, on the, the glass slide and send it off to the lab and then they can tell you very very surely if it is anthrax indeed but uh, it is a natural disease it does affect animals quite negatively especially in drought conditions okay so we were talking about um, zones before and james was talking about the the fight or should i say the critical zones which are then because jared asked me what what comes after the critical zone <laughs> I said fight or flight, obviously, and James is obviously meaning the expletive zone, the time when all of those words are said. And Chat made a funny one. He said it's the O zone for the oh my word zone. Indeed. Now, a couple of questions came through. Let me just double check who they are from. And a question was asked from um, Alaska Safari fan. Are there some species that are more reactive than others? Um, safari fan, you know, the, the thing is, is that elephants are the one you have to be really really aware of. Right, all good? Ah, let just move. We might have a, a bulb. No, I don't think so. Not coming from there. <laughs> the line isn't on fire. I think the biggest one to be aware of, the biggest to be aware of is black rhino white rhino, buffalo and elephant because if you're on a vehicle they, they have the potential to really mess things up for you so you have to be really aware of those species but the beautiful thing is is that they will if they don't like the sound of your vehicle let you know very quickly okay so if you're driving along and you see a black rhino in the distance and it lifts its head up like this Okay, it's very alert. What are you going to do with yourself now? And if it starts to run towards you, that is already the warning zones that are happening. It's best to just drive away, right? Um, if you see a black rhino running towards you with its head up, not the best time to switch your car off and go, ha, huh, Steve said I should just chill now and relax. If any animal, everybody, from a distance starts showing some form of aggressive behavior, which is normally quite dramatic in their ears, their head is up, snorting, throwing head from side to side, high stepping, and they're coming towards you, there's very good chance that you are the concern and it's best time to just drive away. Okay, now there was another question from um, Shaggy Dog. Said, is it possible that you could drive into a situation and not know about the warning signs? 100%, this happens all the time. With our vehicle on, we're not paying attention. So what I encourage you, if you do find yourself driving, self-drive tours in the Kruger or wherever you might find yourself, is be aware, be alert, listen. Don't be driving around the Kruger with your hip-hop music playing. You want to hear what's going on. And what can quite often happen is you're driving along the road and you suddenly find yourself in amongst a herd of elephants. So what has happened there is you've suddenly gone from being outside here to suddenly finding yourself either in the warning zone or in the critical zone. Okay, so if you're suddenly driving along and you hear this enormous racket and enormous amounts of trees being smashed down, talk about the elephants here, for example, and trumpeting and lots of noise, well, at that point, it's not a good idea to stop the car and switch off. At that point, it's best to just keep driving on. But what invariably you might notice is that most people aren't paying attention to the warning signs or the alert signs that are happening and they find themselves in amongst the herd that they didn't know were happening. So be very alert out there, listen, be 
uh, what's the word, situational awareness out in the wilderness is absolutely key. Well, we are now slowly heading towards the southern boundary. I had hoped to pick up some sign of those lions, but I'm afraid I have not picked up any sign of those lions, and I'm sure they're deep in the drainages back there. But maybe we'll happen up across some sort of predator that is knocking about, thinking about trying to kill somebody in this inclement weather. I'm wondering if Stephen has confessed to sabotaging Rusty yet, or if he is, if he is pre still pretending that he had no idea that there was going to be an issue. Wow, there's a battalier that has just alighted from a tree. So. Batelier has just come out of a tree over there, which you can't see because the rain roof's in the way. But I'm just going to, let's go and have a quick look there and see if perchance there isn't a bit of meat hanging in it or a leopard underneath it with a lot of meat thinking about climbing up the tree. Happy Brit, you say the bush is going to look fab with all the rain? It's definitely going to make a difference, absolutely. And it, I think the best part of it, for Juma's sake, is that it's going to raise the water table a bit. It's been a very poor rainy season. I mean, it's normal, in so much as we have good ones and then bad ones. And it's El Nino at the moment, so we expected less. But these, are, we've had about 40 mils, I think, in the last two or three days and that will keep the table up as we go into the dry season. This is the tree that the Batelier came out of. So I just thought we'd have, come and have a quick look and see if there isn't a leopard cat somewhere here. Many of you may remember from quite early last year, Taylor had a kill here with a leopard. And the leopard took the kill up the tree. Ah, ah. Unfortunately, I do not see any sign of a kitty or a hyena or a wild hound or any other form of murderous carnivore. So we shall continue round and go to the southern boundary. See if our lions have popped out there. Very nice to spend time with those lions this morning. Two very good looking lionesses. I always feel lionesses are slightly underappreciated and uh, this is especially the case on um, social media where if you can put up a corking shot of a lioness, you'll get no love whatsoever. And I think it's probably because the males are so sort of strikingly different and it's what everybody wants to see but I mean a lioness good-looking lioness is a spectacular animal righty back onto the road towards twin dams which is on the southern boundary I'm sure it's filled up quite a lot actually since the start of this rain Is cheetah are being very cheeky, you know. When we're not broadcasting, their heads are up, they're looking around, they're looking at us, you know. But as soon as the camera is pointed at them, boom, there goes their head down, fast asleep again. But it's fine, we'll catch them out one in a bit catch one of them out there. Looked like there was about to be a little bit of movement there, but maybe that was just the, uh, the shifting of a leg. Mm. 
Linda Purdy and Deep, this is a, a rather extensive sleep in on this Sunday evening. On Sunday afternoon, not quite the Sunday evening yet. It'll be evening in a few. And uh, now this one is definitely he he's enjoying his nap to the fullest. I don't think I think when we arrived. There was a little bit of movement, the head did come up, but um, yeah, he's been out for a count for the last <laughs> few minutes. Well, shame, I, I don't know, I, I think if I was a teeter, I think I might want to move to behind a bush maybe even if it is a bush in the open just a little bit of extra protection canine girl uh, if there's a need for the vet to come and have a look um, then the ecology team will see will will call for the vet but you know the way that these guys are operating at the moment you know and they're walking it, there isn't really a need no one's really seen much of a struggle uh, amongst amongst them so it, it's actually also quite difficult to try and figure out which one was the one that had the the operation the leg operation um, you know it's healed so incredibly well there's only a slight minor minor little bit of a limp um, but even that, I mean, you can only re really, really see that if you're focusing all your attention on one specific amigo. But, uh, yeah, I don't think the vets, the, they'll need to call for the vet again to come and have a checkup. They will, obviously, the colleagues will come and assess them um, and... Obviously, if they feel like there's maybe something that does need to be looked at, then they will make the call. But I think for the time being, they're doing incredibly well, as is. I think they just they really just needed to get used to how Amakala is and the the kind of the environment that we that you know they would have to live in and around with all the porcupine holes and the art frog holes and the springy holes all over the place um, does make it a bit of a, a minefield for uh, fast runners um, I've seen it also where our lions obviously the lions are much stronger and their bones are much denser than the than the cheetahs but it is possible for a lion to injure themselves as well uh, trying to chase animals it's you can't always see the hole that's covered with grass um, and the same goes for animals trying to evade predators I mean I had a, a, a sighting where the female lion went after um, what was it, it was a black wildebeest and the uh, black wildebeest stumbled he stumbled and uh, the two females were able to capitalize on <laughs> this poor black wildebeest stumble, uh, stumbling and uh, they caught him so uh, it goes both ways. So you may hear a vehicle, you may hear some other voices as uh, we no longer have the sighting all to ourselves. Hello, look at this, you've got the heads up. Okay, Uncle, yes, at least the grass does help them. I mean, look at that. They're still not taller than the grass by sitting like that. And this one is going to... Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. The wind is too much. Oh, 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 oh. It's a little bit of shifting, shifting. Staring off into the distance. Oh, these three boys are in amazing condition. Um, 
it's to my knowledge most of our animals in fact all of our animals go to other game reserves um i haven't heard of any of our game possibly going to hunting farms um obviously that's not what we're about amakala is obviously a place of conservation and all animals born here are, are well looked after so i i think we would we would want that to continue so i think most of our animals do go to places where if they are taken out by anything it's taken out by another predator like a lion or a leopard or a cheetah and not somebody with a rifle come on guys you you, you mean uh, i mean i understand i understand this is definitely bad weather but <laughs> i want to see the faces you got beautiful faces Oh, Esther, incredibly, incredibly smart. Um, yeah, I think they would be getting rather annoyed with the wind and receiving a lot, a lot of cold from this wind. I mean, the, the wind is chilly, and uh, obviously the closer we get towards, uh, obviously our sun leaving us all completely, we don't have any, well, we can't see the sun at the moment, but the sun is still providing us with a bit of light, well, a lot of light, and as soon as that disappears, I think the, 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 the actual warmth factor may just disappear completely. I mean, it's, there is a tiny little bit of a warmth factor here, but it's not much. Have a look at those grumpy, grumpy clouds. Now, I have no problem with those clouds over there. Those look like rain clouds. You're more than welcome to rain there as much as you like. Just continue going off towards the left. You can come back later tonight. We're going to send you over to Steve and Ted, I believe. That the wind blows away the clouds, at least then when you have some sunshine, it'll be nice for you. So, regular Kuna, you wanted to know, is anthrax present in Kenya? It is. It's regarded as one of the most important zoonotic diseases that we have up there. And there is health concerns about it. But it does affect the, the trade in meat. Um, it is actually an endemic disease to sub-Saharan Africa. So, it occurs naturally in the landscape. It occurs naturally in wildlife populations. And it does affect wildlife. But it often affects the weak individuals. It doesn't just wipe out populations. Um, the reason why it wiped out in the plague and domesticated livestock is they don't have the years and years and years of experience of dealing with that disease. So definitely in the plague, as spoke about in the Bible, the fifth plague would have wiped out all of those domesticated livestock because they'd never over centuries evolved to deal with them. So a natural disease on the African sub-Saharan continent um, and most animals. Some I deal with it. You will get outbreaks. It will affect a lot more than normal years, but it doesn't happen every year. And those that survive move on to the next season. Okay, so I'm going to show you a little clip over here. I don't think I've actually shown a clip yet, but on the topic of elephants and predators, I was in Madikwe last year and uh, had a wonderful moment with this lioness. Is it playing? There we go. You see there's a lioness sitting on the log here. Some rhinos coming in to drink. And this elephant bull, not even knowing she was there, decides to take interest in the lions that were just chilling in the shade. Having a good time, they were. But here he goes. See the lions are moving off. What does the elephant do? They move off a bit quicker. And he now picks up his pace. Because... It has worked. His intimidation has worked. So that is why when we we talk about um, being on foot or being in a car and an elephant starts walking towards you. I mean, he wasn't showing any aggression, but he was going, okay, I'm going over there. And what do most animals, including less dominant elephants, do? They turn away. And they walk away they move away 
um, and all animals from an elephant like that move away. And elephants are, you know, generally quite short-sighted. They smell and they hear very well. That's why he didn't even see that other lioness sitting on the log. But he knew the lions were there, and he's like, I'm going to walk over there and chase them. And what did the lions do? They obliged him, they got up and moved. And then as soon as they moved even quicker, he chased them. Now, thankfully, lions are quite quick. Um, if we were on foot or if we were on a vehicle and an elephant started walking towards us, what do, you, what do people think they should do? Well, first of all, you looked at that landscape around. There's plenty of open area. The elephant could go there. He could go there. He doesn't have to walk on that line. So if you stand your ground, uh, he's not showing aggression. He's just showing, I'm big, and he's walking towards them. There was nothing untoward about his behavior. And then they move to, oh, his confidence builds. So if you're in a vehicle and an elephant starts walking up to you like that and you start your car and you start reversing, what's he going to do? He's going to follow you. If you reverse quicker, he's going to come after you even quicker. It becomes a game for him. So when you park there and an elephant starts walking towards you, the car is off. There hasn't been any negative behavior. He walks up. He's curious. You start coming a bit closer and you don't move. If anything, you can say, what are you doing? Speak to him as if you would to someone else you're disagreeing with or like, why are you coming towards me? Very calmly, you don't have to speak. And then he will suddenly realize that they're not moving away. Mm, he's going to start playing, going to start doing something. And he'll probably try and walk around you without losing face, without showing that he's back down in any way. But the last thing you want to do is drive away fast because he's definitely going to chase you. If we still had a roof on, we would have blown away long ago. The, the wind is so, it, it's, it's almost like pushing the car. It's bouncing a little bit. So if there's any movement in the camera, it's not Morgan, it's the wind. But uh, we've got some heads up again. And, oh, those beautiful, beautiful spots going down the, the back of the neck and head all the way to that beautiful darkish color just above the shoulders. Oh, Jackie darling, they are amazing, amazing creatures. And I'm so happy that we were able to get them on screen today, this afternoon. Oh, yeah, this is a big yawn. Yeah. <laughs> oh, tired, tired kitties. Well, I'm wondering, I think they may move from here. I think they're gonna go further. <laughs> Look at this one. Just spread out, tail going to the left, legs going to the right, body doing its own thing. This must have been a rollover. Could only have been a rollover. But it's actually here. I mean, look how thick that tail is compared to the thickness of the legs. Wow. We important, very, very important piece of tool that is. Well, not a piece of tool, piece of equipment for these animals when they are hunting. They need that tail for when the animal darts off to the left and darts off to the right. They need to be able to turn on command quick sticks. Hello, did you just roll over as well? You did. Well, we have come to the southern boundary and we're now in the southern part of the Mbadawamati riverbed and we found tracks of our two lionesses from this morning. And unfortunately, because of the rain, it's tricky to say where they've gone, but I can't find any sign of them crossing out. So I'm wondering, perchance, whether or not that batalier that I saw that you were unable to see because of the rain roof, I wonder if that batalier 
has not been watching the two lions. And I wonder also if they haven't smacked something just off the road there in the block. As they were walking down, I can imagine it being misty and rainy and really not very conducive for the Impala, whose tracks I saw around there as well, not conducive to their seeing or hearing a predator coming. So I think we're going to just hang around here a little bit. We're very close to the southern boundary, and in fact, I'll be able to show you this animal now. Not this animal, this bird. You see the bird there, BK? I know it's 78 miles off, but at least at this angle we can have a look at it. Jill on the hill, what was that? That is not the same bird. Oof. What is that? No, Jill, um, most felines do not live in groups. Lions are the only true social cats. Cheetahs almost social with the males, but definitely not with the females. And there are no other social cats in the world. I don't know what that is. I'm looking with my binoculars, but I could not tell you what that is. It looks like it might be a juvenile step eagle, at least step buzzard or common buzzard. But it's very tricky to say. I think we should try and get a little bit closer and see. And I wonder, just wonder maybe if those lions aren't close by there. Okay, let's try. Let's see if we can get up there. Shaggy Dog, you want to know if it'll help if American viewers sign the petition? Um, Shaggy Dog, no, I, no it won't. Um, I know a lot of you have signed. Uh, I think it still makes a difference, but it, it's, not as, it's not as meaningful if, as if a South African signs it, because obviously you guys don't get DSTV. So that's a good, good point. And a number of you from overseas have signed, and we're grateful for those signatures as well, because, you know, it's good solidarity and shows that we have a lot of meaning but you know most of those 16,000 signatures are South African what's that a vehicle track it does look like a bit of a vehicle two track we can take a little look in here I don't think anybody would have driven in here though yes <laughs> GC, <laughs> you know, you say that, and you say it at the right time that I shouldn't get stuck, because the last time I was stuck, in fact, the, la <laughs> the last three times I was stuck was with poor BK. <laughs> and <laughs> when was that? It must have been November. Leopard. <laughs> Quite by chance, but there's a leopard there. I'm pretty sure it's Mawati. Well spotted, BK. Yeah. It's that beastly ghost, Morwati. Just stop, please. Do us a solid. You know what? It wasn't a lioness's tracks I saw. It was a male leopard that had been rained on. That's exactly what we saw. Now, I long for the days of Tingana, who would have just popped his head up and given us another two hours with him. This guy, there he goes. We're going to be very lucky to get more than 10 seconds with him, especially if I continue to drive like this. I wonder if he won't just stop moving for two seconds we went off that way and we've got to keep our distance from him you see him BK so it wasn't the lionesses that makes a lot more sense 
if I only saw one track. There he is, straight ahead of us. He's dead straight ahead underneath that thick green bush. I'm just trying to keep my distance from him. Now, for those of you who are perhaps new viewers, this is Mawati the male leopard, who is a, he's the dominant male here. And I'm not particularly fond of him, and that's just because he refuses to sit still. And his predecessor, Tengana, we'd be able to spend hours and hours and hours with him. This guy, for television purposes, is utterly horrific. There he goes. Can you see him there, BK? And I mean, this is quite a good sighting of him. He just doesn't like being seen. Which is, I mean, that's very leopardish, of course. Thankfully, his offspring don't seem to share his fear of vehicles, which is good. Yeah, Teresa, he did give me a look, but I can assure you I gave him the same look. My look said, please, 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 do, um, do us a solid and just sit still. So I'm trying to move parallel with him. There I can see him, as opposed to behind him, so that he doesn't feel like he's being followed. And maybe, just maybe, he'll stop. But I don't think he will, you know, I think as long as we're here, I think he's just going to keep going. I've had two good sightings of him. One, when he was mating, and one, when he had a kill. And in fact, one when he was chasing, who was he chasing? I think he was chasing Maribs. But other than that, just been hopeless. Oh, well, at least we got a look at him, right? Oh, dear. It also doesn't help when I drive over a stump. Go kapong, pong, pong, pong. Let's turn up here, BK. Let's try and get one more look at him. And you got him? Yeah. Moving. Moving. Jilibi, leopard crawl behind Mawati. I would. The thing is, Jilibi, it's just that I'm going to get wet if I do that. BK can see him. He's going to... Oh, yes, I can see him. He's, it's, just, it's just these little spots fleeting through the thick bush. The temptation is to go faster, but that would be a, a poor idea. We're about 30 or 40 meters. There he is. Oh, look at that. There you go. Just sit. Just sit. 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 Relax. We can't see you. Just relax. Sit down. Take a chill Sunday afternoon. Come and climb into a tree. Yes, Shreyas, indeed. You say, what an awesome find. I tell you, it would be a lot more awesome if he'd sit still for two minutes or two hours. Desperately to see if I can get a photograph of him. Because... There we go. And there. Let's see where he goes. I don't think 
he's afraid of us. I just think that he is so leopardish. He just doesn't want to be around us. I know this isn't the best picture, but I don't want to move. Just wait and see what comes of this. Oh, Linda, he is a beautiful cat. There's no doubt about that. He's amazingly irritating, but um, he is a beautiful cat. Origins shrouded in mystery. Yeah, you're right, Gilroy, you're absolutely right. Fantastic and definitely worth braving the weather. <laughs> That's almost as good as your elephant shot earlier, BK. I can't actually see where he is. Is he straight ahead of us? Okay, you got him. He's still there, in case you're wondering. There we go, he's moved. Do you think he's moving away from us? Or just parallel? Do you think he'll pop out or should we go forward a bit? Let's try and go forward a bit. Still sitting here with our beautiful, beautiful three amigos, enjoying every minute of it. Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous boy over there. And he put his head down. Not sleeping, just resting, looking around every now and then. You know, they are in a safe area but they don't well i'm sure that they do know that this is pretty much a safe area but they're still on the lookout for any form of threat obviously we know lions do not tolerate cheetah in their vicinity and that vicinity is the whole of amakala and i'm pretty sure well they, they were they are they haven't been up so, yeah, they haven't been up to our area since we've been back, but they, uh, yeah, every now and then they do kind of march up here through the dune forest to get to the far western part of the reserve to have a look for them. Um, but uh, these cheetah have been far too clever and they've actually stuck around in this area. Elizabeth, good gracious, I feel like a kite, you know, the wind is blowing, <laughs> and it, it's not just like constantly blowing, it blows, blows, and all of a sudden there's this massive gust which pushes half the car over, and then comes back, um, so it's it's like, it's non-stop big gusts of wind that are really doing it, but uh, majority of the time, it's just a constant wind.
Yo, this guy is comfortable. He's rolled over. Or I wouldn't say rolled over. He's probably shifted just a little bit more to the right. No, he's, I think, in the perfect position there with his tail <laughs> pushed up against a tuft of grass there. And this is pretty cool. You I mean, look at the spots on his tail compared to the spots on his body. Gary, absolutely. Absolutely. Lions, cheetahs, leopard will definitely use that method for hunting. Um, it's actually, yeah, it's a... Me <laughs> I wouldn't say it's a method that they use all the time. Um, I'd say lions use it more than cheetahs and I think leopards do use it a fair, fair amount. You know, leopards are more of your ambush predators, so they normally sit and wait for you somewhere. And as soon as you kind of step into that striking range, then they strike. Whereas a cheetah is more of a chasing creature. You know, they run you down. And uh, because they're much faster than you, they catch up to you quite quickly. Lions are a bit of both. You know, they, they, they do a bit of stalking, a bit of ambushing, strategic uh, uh, kind of aligning to, to get the animal into the right place. But, uh, yeah, using, using scent. <laughs> This is that gust of wind I was talking about. Using the, 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 the scent of the animal, they definitely come from uh, downwind, upwind towards the animal, and they will obviously smell it out. And yeah, But also using their smell, they'll be able to determine which animals are in the area. Because, you know, generally, antelope, not all antelopes smell the same. Right, we're going to take you to watch a video of uh, the difference between cheetahs and leopards. This is pretty cool. Have a look. The ultimate triple threat versus an iconic specialist. One built for stealth, power and ambush. The other designed for speed. The cheetah decorated with black spots. The leopard with copper rosettes. The leopard, a stalking cat of the woodlands. The cheetah, a coursing cat of the plains. Cheetahs are built exclusively for speed and lack the strength to stash their kills or fight off scavengers. While leopards are strong and agile enough to hoist their kills away from thieving lions and hyenas, And while leopards live alone, cheetah often find comfort in the company and protection of siblings. Each cat is the master of their domain and holds a spot atop the African food chain. Right, well, um, we did actually have another nice sighting of him disappearing off towards the south and he's now truly gone. A lot of you are asking where he is. He's just gone across the southern boundary at a place called Baboon Pan. So not far from Twin Dams, for those of you who watch where we are. And he's now on Little Gauri. And that's the end of that. Little Gauri is the reserve where we cannot go. And we, I mean, that uh, by the, Standard of Malwati sightings, that's pretty good. That was actually fine. That worked nicely. I'm not going to say that I've changed my impression of him, but uh, it was nice to, to see him again. Good. And then you had a nice look at the differences between cheetah and leopards, which of course is just a good excuse to show two of the most beautiful cats in tandem.
Catterwall, I certainly can't do that for you in public. I did it once and the vitriol I received on social media was so swift, so aggressive, so threatening and so terrifying that I will never ever again in public cast any aspersions on the beauty of any leopard. I'm not even going to, I mean the incident has left, left me with such post-traumatic stress that I, I, I can't even tell you what about the incident. It was a long time ago and I suggested that a leopard was perhaps not as good looking as some other leopards and well I, I mean it was it was it was uh, it was uh, I, I, it was it was scary. So um, no my official answer to that question is no I think all leopards are beautiful. Please don't ever ask me that again. The official Wild Earth line is that all leopards are beautiful. Sure. Hmm. Talk about digging a pit and trying to push me into it. That last question. <laughs> oh. No, we can't go there. Somebody found a rhino, but it's too far from where we are and where we can't go. No, Kimberly, I don't think he was tracking another leopard. I think he was resting on the termite mound there, and I think that he simply moved off because we disturbed him. We went to we only went off road because BK saw some old, an old two track, and I thought, well, it goes towards where that bird was sitting, so maybe let's go and have a look. The bird flew off, and Mawati popped out. So there was a lot of luck involved there, as there normally is with leopards. I don't think he's tracking another leopard. I really think he was just trying to increase the distance between us and him. which is his general modus operandi. Now the rain has abated, which is really quite nice. I'm not sure how long it's going to abate, but hopefully for a fair amount of time. And we will be able to conduct this game drive in relative dryness. And maybe, just maybe, those lionesses will pop out. It's always nice to come out after rain like this because it does feel quite fresh and quite new and like you're the only one who's ever been here. And also because there's so little activity when the weather is like this on the reserve from human beings. No one else has come through here. So it feels like it's all yours, which it is. I'll take off my canvas leg cover. There we go. Right, we'll go off towards Treehouse Dam, which is south central Juma, and see if anything hasn't pitched up there. I'm not sure why they would on a wet day like this, unless they were particularly aquatic. Well, thanks, James, and well done for spotting Morwati. Now, that goes right into the zones of an animal. I mean, it doesn't necessarily, these zones I was talking about don't always need to be negative. They don't always need to be an aggressive response. Um, you noticed as James got closer, suddenly a leopard moved off. He didn't see the leopard because you don't always see these cats. But if that cat was relaxed, it would have allowed him to come closer and closer and closer. But Moati's got very different alert and uh, warning zones to everybody else and when he's not feeling 100% relaxed which is normally every day or when it is after dark he normally is quite relaxed then 
his space is quite far. But as you saw, James is keeping space. He was staying quite far behind him. And then when he did have a long distance visual, he could view him quite a right without Mawati really behaving in any way. So that is the same thing about warning signs with regards to distance and all of that. So you don't always have to get into a critical zone with an animal. Some animals are not relaxed at all and they're going to move away from you from a distance. So I've got a, a clip here that uh, I'm not sure if it was with Khat, but um, I was in Pridelands, in the, the eastern side of Pridelands, into the property called Boston. And I'm going to talk over the clip a little bit. Um, came across a herd of elephant in the road. And we'll just have a look at the behavior here. There's a young bull stepping in front of us here. He does a bit of a kick of the leg. It's a little bit uncertain of that. What's going on? Who are these people here? But notice the rest of the herd. The tails are flicking. The tails are wagging. There's some play in the background. Um, there's some sort of feeding happening, but this one closest to us is not 100% certain about what's going on. It's not very confident, but yet the tail is quite relaxed. The rest of the herd is not reacting in any way whatsoever. Sorry about the wind noise on my microphone there as well. Um, and so you've always got to, when you find a herd like this, pay attention to the biggest females. Uh, and where are the youngsters? Sorry about that microphone there let me see if I can turn that off maybe or I'm sure Jared will oh sorry about that now have a look how youngsters are materializing this one who's on the right who's closest to us is is sort of testing the grass but is not actually grabbing the grass now a bit of dust in the face sort of a, a comforting comforting strategy and the herd is coming closer and closer. Look at how they're coming closer and closer towards us. There hasn't been any change in behavior, really. There's a lot of young boys there. Now these two on the right are actually goading each other. The one's going, what do you mean? Why are you concerned about this vehicle over here? I mean, really? And then he's like, oh, but I wasn't really concerned. I just, you know, I wasn't sure if I could go closer. But here they are in the open, enjoying themselves, and now this other youngsters being a little bit more brave. See how he's kicking his foot like that. Jasmine, you know, being on foot can often be quite a different story, but, you know, we're talking about on the vehicle for now. A breeding herd of elephant like this, you wouldn't at all try and approach them on foot in the open like this. You'd always try and have some form of cover. You always try and have some form of elevation. And essentially with the breeding herd, when you're on foot, you don't even want them to know that you're there. You want to view them and leave. So this is all very much vehicle-based right now. So you can see all of these boys on the right. They're very curious about what's going on. But there's a female on the far left. She's a female. She's not concerned. And these boys will come as close to us as they see fit. Maybe feeding playing with the sand, these sort of sightings, you should just enjoy, film, breathe. There's no negative behavior happening here at all. Babies in the open, a medium-sized cow over there, or a big cow there, she's very, very relaxed. And my finger pointing at something, I'm not quite sure. But the baby, look at the little one over there. Oh, you've just got to, here we go. He's, now he's very brave. Now he's showing all the signs of an elephant who's fully alert. Looking down the nose, look how big he makes himself, the tail is stiff, walking sideways. Now when a big female does that to you, then you must be very aware of what's about to happen next. But after all of what has happened, after all of that behavior of the elephants being there doing their thing, the females being relaxed, only then towards the end a young male does that to you enjoy it there's absolutely no negative response happening but if you came along and you found a herd and immediately one of the females did that she looked up like this the ears up the head up and the tail and you may be coming along the road and you see them maybe switch the car off before you get too close or if they're far off the road and they're coming or you're driving past and they do that rather just keep going uh, there's no need to cause them to react anymore. But if you're driving along and they're all sort of hanging about doing their thing, switch the car off, spend some time there, 
when they start to relax again or if they continue to relax you can go a little bit closer but as soon as you see a female doing what that bull did at the end there it's best to either leave the scene or to do absolutely nothing with regards to starting your car or causing them to react in any way okay well hopefully eric's cheetahs are reacting or getting up and doing something shortly the wind is still pumping in on Michaela. let's go catch up with the boys down there Goodness gracious. Yes, James, the wind <laughs> is still pumping down here. Um, Morgan and I were actually thinking it's probably got a little bit worse than what it originally was at the beginning of drive. Um, well, the gusts have definitely become more violent and uh, become very, very loud as well. Wachita has rolled over again. And this is pretty much the same type of rolling over that we do. Morgan's just going to quickly like wipe the lens with a lappy. A yellow lappy. And a lappy, for those who don't know, is a yellow cloth. A cloth in Afrikaans. It's also going to change the lighting a little bit there. As it's getting... Sorry, no, I misheard you, my mistake. Uh, <laughs> I thought he said he was going to change the colour. Cecile, uh, I'm not actually too sure what the plan is for these three amigos and uh, the possible chance of them producing offspring. Um, uh, I know, you know, obviously we did have that female and then she died. Um, but there was also talk of um, one of the Amigos, or all three of them, going across to Amma North or that area where Pumalela is and uh, dropping them off there in the hopes that maybe they connect with Pumalela and are able to maybe mate with her and produce even more offspring. Um, but uh, we're not actually too sure but uh, it's, it's, yeah, I'm not too sure. But there is also, there is talk of joining majority, well, obviously this is, this part of the reserve is joined with the main part of the reserve uh, by a tunnel. I mean, any, any of the animals can go through if they really, really want to. The fact is that they don't. <laughs> um, they can see the light on the other side, but they don't know whether they can go through. Um, and then, obviously to join Amma North with the main reserve um, and obviously Amma North is where Pumalela is so there'll be a time where she'll possibly be able to cross over and they'll be able to cross over so this could be quite exciting for for Amakala and uh, you know allowing our animals now to walk everywhere wherever they feel fit to but I haven't heard any talk of uh, introducing a new female cheetah to the reserve. Okay, we had a little bit of a drizzle come through. Um, I was rather hoping it, it wasn't going to happen this way. And they are definitely the clouds in our area of operation have definitely gone darker which is it's a little bit of a a worry i would say because we don't necessarily want it to rain we are dry and would like to stay dry and those three do just look like they want a blanket for a nap and i'd quite like to join them in that nap as well underneath a blanket that sounds very toasty and warm and I think could be very much appreciated at this point in time. Yes, I've got now my thick jacket on because the wind was just getting far, far too cold and uh, unbearable. But I also thought it was going to rain and uh, I don't think it's going to rain. Touch wood, touch wood. We hope not. Uh, but uh, it does look a little bit like it's going to. Look at that white.
right belly. And one thing I've noticed the cheetah and I pointed it out in the earlier in the drive was the spots on the tail are much bigger. Much bigger. They're almost like <laughs> twice as big, almost three times as big as the the spots that you'll find on the back and on the, the side of the animal. All right, we're going to send you over to James with his animals on the move. I must say I'm feeling very sorry for Eric and Morgan. Uh, I know that Morgan has been a little under the weather and has probably come out, you know, not feeling on top of his game. There is a crested Franklin we may as well have a look at. And I wonder if his fairly vast array of dreadlocks help him to stay warm in wind like that. In fact, both, <laughs> both Morgan and Eric have got a fairly astonishing array of um, hair between the two of them. I'm just jealous because I have no hair at all, so I can't make such things. And I wonder if they're helped by by, by their hair in the wind. Crested Franklin there, and in the background, ooh, it's actually it's quite interesting. In the background, you might be able to see flittering about a Levellian's cuckoo, I think. And I wonder, given the lateness of the year, if that Levellian's cuckoo isn't in fact knocking about with a flock of babblers uh, which have raised it. I, I'll go forward a bit. So the Levalence cuckoo at this time of the year you can sometimes see juveniles that are going to overwinter with us and they're still with their flocks of babblers that raised them but obviously are twice the size. It's ridiculous to watch but absolutely fascinating. And for those of you wondering what BK's tent looks like, I have sent a message to the final control room and they are going to tweet it for you. There's the cuckoos in here. He's in this Peltiforum bush. I have now parked you squarely behind the tree. There's something interesting going on in here. Can you see him flitting about in there, BK? He's on the, the sort of main trunk. And there are quite a few small birds here as well. There we go. He's definitely not the only bird in this area. A few on the top. Can you see any? It's just moving very fast. Okay, there's a long-billed crombeck as well. Uh, Kyle, it, if birds are active, does it mean the rain has left? No, it means the rain has stopped, but it doesn't mean it's not coming back. But it's a good thought. Yes, birds do come out when the rain stops. No, I'm afraid I think he has absconded or is going to hide from us. Okay, let us continue. So far, the southeastern horizon the look, doesn't look like there's a squall coming in. It looks like the clouds lifted a bit, which is nice. That's true. That's true, James Richard. You say, don't worry about Morgan. At least I don't have to worry about my hair in the rain. Absolutely true. Nor do I have to worry about drying it. 
after a shower. <laughs> I, for those of you who are vaguely concerned, that's a beautiful shot there, BK. Just behind the pole, I bet. Can you see the batelier with his wings out, drying his wings? Oh, wow, look at that. Mama Batalia, in all her glory, her wings outstretched to the southern wind, drying them. Oh, my dear, you look so pretty this Sunday afternoon. Thank you, she says and bows. Except I don't think it's a female. I think it's a male. Hang on a second. Because I have a one megabyte brain, I have to keep checking these sorts of things. It is a female. It is a female. Definitely, look at her. Isn't she gorgeous? Oh, wow. Yeah, as you say, African sunset. Uh, BK doing his wet weather like a boss. Absolutely. Isn't that just magic? Blow drying her feathers. Gosh, that's lovely. Magnificent. This is spectacular. I wonder if, no, I'm not going to try and get closer. I think this is, this is perfect. And so this is part of the group that lives around here, the two males and the female. If their chick has survived, I'm pretty, it must have fledged by now. In fact, it's definitely fledged by now. So they won't be spending time on the nest anymore. Yeah, I mean, Elizabeth, this bird is, this is a special bird. And I think worth noting that although we see them commonly here, they're, I'm not sure if they're endangered, but they're certainly threatened. And it's because they do not occur outside of protected areas. And it's because they get poisoned and killed and humans are just pretty awful when it comes to raptors. But where areas are protected, they will survive in relatively large numbers. I really think, you know, the, the Eastern Cape where, where Eric is currently <laughs> about to be <laughs> blown down towards the, down towards the Cape. Um, I think that, that we will know that they've made massive strides they've they've really done an incredible job in a place like Amakala and Kericha and lots of others where they've and Sibuya and other beautiful reserves there where they've uh, reclaimed farmland and it's now under wildlife but we will really know that they have done they've they've kind of succeeded when the batalia and the vulture return to that area and Voltaire. So we'll enjoy this chap for another 60 seconds and then we'll probably press on and see what else we can see. You can see this is a female by the fact that She's wearing, I was going to try and say something amusing there, but I failed to think of anything amusing. You can see it because she's got the very thin black stripe 
underneath her white wings, you can see there. And also she's got that really beautiful kind of chestnut colored back. Vicky, you say she looks miserable. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think she certainly has looked happier. She's got a lot of work to do on those feathers. Every feather must be preened. The barbs and barbules and barbicels reattached so that the feathers rem retain their integrity. So that when she takes to the air again, she doesn't fall from the sky in an unruly heap. There's nothing less dignified than falling from the sky when you're supposed to be able to fly. Beautiful. Right, let's go and see if we can find some lions. Welcome back live, everybody. What a wonderful scene with the batelier there. So lovely to see her just stretching out uh, so, sh so nicely, showing you the underwing. You don't often see that from a bird that's perched uh, and very easy to identify her as the female. Uh, and indeed, James comments about the Eastern Cape and making great strides in places like Amakala. We see a fair, bit, fair number of birds of prey there. But up here in the Kruger, in very good numbers. But as he says, outside of the reserves, not so much. I mean, that goes for elephants as well. You don't really find elephants outside of conservation areas. Yeah, it's just the way it is. And talking about elephants, well, I've got more information here to go through. Let's uh, find the right clip, shall we? Here we go. That's not working for some reason. Let me stop that one. There we go. And then play that one. Okay, so first thing you need to pay attention to everybody is when you find elephants is to give them as much space as you can. Um, if there's lots of space, lots of area for the elephants to go, they will move where they need to go. Um, don't block their pathway. If you see a large herd of elephants walking in your general direction uh, and it's quite spacious and lots of place to move, position yourself in a way that they might come closer or they might not. They'll make the decision on their own. And essentially what they're doing is they are forming their own boundaries with you, their own critical lines, their own warning and alert lines. And they'll only come as close to you as they want to. But in this clip here, what's so obvious? There's babies all over the place. Babies, babies, babies. Feeding, trunks moving, ears flapping, babies feeding. And this herd of elephants, this is a Medique, actually surrounded me. I spent about 45 minutes with them. I just kept repositioning and getting in front of them and repositioning. And they just kept walking around us. Very typical behavior of a relaxed herd of elephants. Dark man lover, they are really kings of the jungle. And you can actually often see the different makeups of the herds you can see here there's a small group there's probably another group there maybe two or three groups in amongst this herd all related um, and all they're doing is feeding move through the landscape lots of space for them to go and i'm not blocking their way in any way so you can have a really good time with elephants if you find yourself in a situation where there's lots of space so space is key often find little babies will come a bit closer to you like this they're a little bit more curious because everybody's relaxed and mama there just above that baby's shoulder you can see the eyes are pretty much half lidded she's not even aware of what's going on although she's very aware of what's going on she's just not concerned okay so that's the key look for the females what are the females doing can you see the babies you see this one's going to walk around me that's her zone and the baby's got to follow the same line. That's exactly the distance she wants to keep from me. And the youngster's like, okay, hello. Now, if mum didn't like the youngster coming towards me, she would have stopped it or she would have prevented it doing so. But clearly, she's not concerned at all. Feeding as they go. 
Moments like this, very easy to see relaxed behavior. Breathe. Hmm. Magical time. And look how close the youngsters are coming to us. They may be a little bit more nervous, but they haven't been told they can't. Haven't been told that they can't. Eric, if mum didn't want the baby near you, the baby wouldn't be near you. It's that simple. That simple. Mother knows what's going on here. And if she's not comfortable with your vehicle there, she wouldn't let the baby come and play. Um, she would keep it away. They, you wouldn't even know. You wouldn't hear the communication that's going between them. You just wouldn't see the babies. They would be elsewhere. So that is the key. Babies in the open. Babies between you and the mothers. Very relaxed. If you can't see the babies or they're all bunched together, also, see, there's me greeting. Hello. Come and say hello to me, this little elephant. If you can't see the babies or maybe they bunched um, up, all the herd is bunched together, big females and the babies in between, and they still come towards you, that's okay. They're not showing you aggression, but they are alert. And they're coming closer and they're sort of filing with the children. You know when you get off the subway and you're moving through people and you've maybe got your kids with you, what do you do? You sort of all come together. You're not like challenging the world and everyone's about to get you, but you're aware that there's there's other people around and there's potential to get lost and so you all sort of bunch together and move through the subway so that you can all go to where you need to go. Alert, aware, but not showing aggressive behavior to anybody. When you see elephants doing that, just switch off, enjoy, spend time, and most definitely take some pictures or some video. Okay, well, it sounds like Eric is on the move. Are his cheetahs on the move or what's happening down in Amakala? Indeed, we have been on the move. We've moved away from our three amigos. They looked fairly happy and uh, not like they were going to move. I think they're going to stay uh, rather comfortable there. But there's also a small bush that I think that they might get up and go and crawl underneath. Now that we have <laughs> the drizzle slash rain coming down on us, um, you know, they may move. But the thing is, wild cats or big cats, you know, they're not, uh, they're not like your, your house cat that dislikes water and dislikes rain and as soon as it gets wet, it's miserable and they run away. They, lions and cheetah and leopard, they take almost like a different approach. They don't mind it, but obviously if it gets a little bit too bad, then they'll move off. But, uh, We've left them to their devices there. And now we are overlooking this beautiful landscape that is Amakala Private Game Reserve. With some rather unhappy, gloomy weather in the background. I do think we, we are going to be in for some interesting weather now moving forward into the evening. Michelle, yes, yeah, definitely scary and beautiful. I think more scary at this point because, uh, well, myself and Morgan, we are nice and dry and uh, we don't particularly want to get wet, but uh, it's still beautiful. I mean, the landscape here, this is one of my favorite little viewpoints uh, um, here on Amakana. I was driving around with guests on this side and we had the opportunity to stop for a drink stop. Majority of our drink stops would have been at this little kind of patch of grass. It's very nice and open and you can watch the see the valleys and the mountains in the surrounding areas. It's it is quite nice. Anyway, we're gonna move further down into that valley to try and see if we can't find some animals and get out of this wind. In the meantime we're gonna send you back up to James. Mm, Eric 
What a brave man. So we came around the corner here because we had what looked like some relatively fresh male leopard tracks and our batelier just didn't fly away and so we thought we'd do another little segment with her before continuing on our merry way. She looks rather spectacular, especially with the grey background. Grey is a, is a very evocative colour and depending on the shade it can be either inspiring, I think sort of quite meaningful in many respects, almost uh, it's got a gravitas about it and sometimes it can be just plain dull. And in this case, the various shades are dramatic, very dramatic. She's now drying the back of her wings. The front, she thinks, are dry enough. Baila, definitely the same batelier I saw earlier. It's sitting on the same tree. Are you think? Are you talking about? Oh, I think maybe you're talking about the the one that I saw much earlier, just before we saw the leopard. Uh, no, it's it's not the same one. That one was a juvenile. This one is an adult female. But this is exactly the same one we saw a little bit earlier on the same tree. Yeah. Sorry, I thought that was a bit of an odd question, and then I realised that in fact it was my small brain that was making it odd. You can hear the ox peckers going. <laughs> I've always loved your name, Sugar Bits. Uh, yeah, Sugar Bits. <laughs> You're obviously referring to the cuckoo we saw and how many characteristics the cuckoo will learn or absorb from its hosts? And the answer is not many. You know, the cuckoo will grow up and fledge with its host. It will migrate over these, sometimes with other juvenile cuckoos and sometimes with adult cuckoos. But the instinct to go away and migrate is hardwired. They don't have the same calls, so they don't learn the calls of their hosts. They have their own calls hardwired into them. And it's, I mean, they, they don't really learn to eat the same, I suppose they do learn to eat the same stuff, but they, their hosts normally eat the same stuff anyway. Um, and then nobody teaches them to, nobody teaches them where to lay their eggs. And maybe, just maybe in the recesses of their memories, uh, or what passes for a memory for a cuckoo, maybe they realize, or no, they don't realize, they have some thought that in order to raise youngsters, they need to, you know, place them in a host's nest, but maybe they think that they, maybe they think that they are that host, if you know what I mean. Maybe they think they're the same species as the host, so maybe the levalence cuckoo actually doesn't think it's a levalence cuckoo, it thinks it's a, a babbler. Although they mate with other levalence cuckoos and not with babblers. It's also complicated, I don't know. But I don't think they learn a lot from their hosts. Most of what they know is instinctual. The problem with cuckoos, as with in fact all wild animals, is that they don't speak English or any other language that we can speak, which makes trying to figure out what on earth they're doing very difficult. Now, I think we're going to move on because it's getting dark and our battalier's moved on. She's decided that she doesn't like us anymore 
thinks all our talk of cuckoos is absolute garbage. Uh, we're not talking about her anymore. She's very vain, and so we're going to carry on. The light is fading fast because the cloud is so thick that the poor sun has failed to gain any sort of, um, I know he said purchase, but that's the wrong word. It's failed to, failed to shine on us. So let's just go around the corner here and see if our lions aren't around the waterhole known as Chelapan, because they could have fetched up there. And they'll start moving round about now, which will be quite nice to have some moving lions like we did this morning. We are going to take one moment, BK, to look at the humble yet semi-magnificent Swainson's Spurfowl perched king of the castle on the termite mound. Very good. Very good display there. Do it again. Show us what you're made of. Give us a call. It does not have an attractive call to my ear. I'm sure to other Swainson Spurfowls, it probably sounds like Pavarotti in his prime. Or Taylor Swift, if you happen to be a bit younger and desirous of a different genre. Right, that's enough time for the Swainson Spurfowl. I'm sorry, Swainson Spurfowl, that we didn't give you the same sort of consideration as we did the Batelure. But that's what comes with being sort of short of stature. I know how you feel. Right, we shall now head on to a road known as Pangolin Track. That will lead us to the pan known as Chella Pan. And with luck, the lions. And here's some Aramark babblers calling. They're the ones who will have looked after probably one Levelance cuckoo, that poor flock. They're probably lamenting it right now. What happened to Johnny? Johnny just upped and left. Went off, gone overseas. Probably exactly what they're lamenting. BK, do you think we're still live? Yep. Yep. We are. All fair. Huh. Oh, welcome back live, everybody. What wonderful scenes with James and his battleur and then his fans and spur file. So a question that came through from um, Mac. Would the matriarch uh, make a youngster move away from a vehicle if it was acting aggressive? So, Mac, I've seen that a number of times where the whole herd is just behaving in a nice, relaxed manner. It allows the youngsters expression. I suppose you can think of a human family as well. If you're on the beach or you're in an environment where the adults are all feeling safe and secure, what happens? The kids run a riot, don't they? They are free to roam and to do their thing. And so essentially with the breeding herd of elephant as well, the babies might become a little bit more um, boisterous, especially young boys, and they might come up to the car and do all sorts of things now mum can often talk to them in a low voice that you don't always hear but i've seen a female come up and go come and physically pull the youngster away and almost the youngster's like no but i want to play uh, it's very similar to human babies where your child is annoying the table next door at a restaurant and you have to physically come and say come on child let's move away from the scene um, i've seen elephants do that a number of times it's really quite entertaining 
and Linda Campbell. Um, what a teachable moment. Thanks, Linda. I'm glad that you're learning something here. Um, another question came through from Diane. Do the babies always do what they're told? No, they don't, Diane. No, they don't. And sometimes they throw a tantrum because they want to do something else. Um, they want to play. They want to come and do their thing. But mum has to sometimes put her foot down and be the disciplinarian where she physically has to push them out of the way. But I've seen it where they have to physically pull them. <laughs> I want to go. I want to go. Okay, so now I've got a, a clip here of a herd that was a lot more alert and a lot more sort of bunched together um, than the ones we've been seeing. And uh, what can probably play a role in this is that it was a little bit windier. A little bit windier. Uh, the herd initially here seems relaxed. Um, and you start seeing, okay, there's babies feeding. Have a look at this girl in the middle of frame. See how she did that thing with her foot there? She sort of lifted the foot up and was like, shook a little bit. She's not 100% certain about us here. And her head is a little bit lifted. Can you see the body language? See the foot once again? And her head is a bit high. Her eyes are a little bit more open and the head is moving from side to side. Now the wind is probably potentially being predators around. There's some smells going on that she's not quite sure about. And then suddenly there's this vehicle. What is this vehicle doing here? Now the other one is next to her and they're having a conversation. See her foot also goes up. They're very alert. They're trying to sniff. Now this is very alert behavior. It's not warning behavior. It's very alert. They're trying to, the one at the back there has moved off. Head very well raised. See how the babies come in amongst the mix now in between the two adults. And they're having a proper conversation now. You can even see their foreheads or the temporal gland has been streaming. There's been some stress in their day. Don't know what it could be. And here's a big girl. Now this girl is very alert, but see they, they're not showing any negative behavior. This girl is a big girl. She's even got a collar on. Um, and so essentially, Kendall, you're jealous of the sightings, but you could see that they were much more bunched together. The youngsters weren't really stepping forward, and there was definitely communication happening amongst those three adult elephants. And that big girl who came towards the end there, just from her size, you'd probably expect her to be the matriarch. But still, no negative behavior was happening. They were just like, what's happening? Mm, there's a vehicle here. And eventually they all bunched together. I thought I captured it on the clip and they all just sort of moved around me. Um, I then re did reposition the vehicle and tried to see them again. And they showed more sort of alert behavior. And I left them alone. You don't push it. When they're not showing the same behavior, you saw in the previous clip with the babies and everyone's just feeding. You can keep bouncing in front, bouncing in front and keep getting them coming towards you. But when they're showing that alertness, the head's raised, that alert behavior, if you push that, very likely you're going to get a reaction because they've kind of shown you they're alert, they're not very comfortable and they might move away quickly or they might push you back in some form of warning behavior. So I hope that has been quite helpful for you this evening. Okay, well, it sounds like James is on the move. Let's see if he managed to catch up with his lions around Chelapan. Yes, Stephen, I'm on the move. Your bottom must be getting quite sore sitting where you are, I imagine. And it's certainly dry. I've broken the golden rule and I have stayed out despite the fact that my underpants were wet some 90 minutes ago. <laughs> I think that sounds like from Steve's lessons and the videos he's found today that you could probably all drive into the Kruger and quite comfortably tell half of the imbeciles who drive around the elephants there that uh, they're not doing the right thing and you could tell them exactly what to do. Nice combo actually on a day like today to have Stivovo in the tent doing some interesting bits and pieces. I haven't found any lion tracks and night time fell in the last two minutes. So dusk lasted two minutes and it's now night basically. And I think those lions are probably still in the drainage line. 
where they headed at five to two this afternoon. Might be lucky along here. It's a quite tricky decision for an animal to decide where to lie because there is literally nowhere dry anymore. Grant, you say we need a tent day to, to uh, investigate human behavior because we are the problem. Um, Grant, I do agree that we're the problem. I don't agree that we'd solve the problem or understand any more about it by investigating human behavior at good grief. Look at that. It's the rarest animal at Juma. I'm being slightly sarcastic. Go into IR. Here we go. That's the IR sound. You can go into IR now. PK. Giraffe. Can you believe it? Do you know how frequently we have guests in camp? Well, we don't have guests frequently, but when they come through, they say, well, where are the giraffe? And you have to say, well, I don't see a lot of them. I seem to remember, Michael Fleet was just telling me that my ninth anniversary at Wild Earth is coming up. And I seem to remember there being a lot more giraffe in the dim mists of prehistory. We've managed to find a nice sheltered, well, we've, it's not really a sheltered area, we've just parked next to a bush, a big enough bush, and uh, well, we now feel what it feels like to be out of the wind, and it is amazing. And we are overlooking what appears to be the main reserve of Amakala. And we... What we are looking at is basically the area where we had our elephants two days ago drinking water, lying in the mud. That amazing, amazing sighting that we had, actually. That was quite a sighting, actually. Good grief. But, um, yeah. So down there, there is that... Mm, not a mud wallow, it is a pan area. But as you can see, in between us and there, it looks like mist. Well, it's not mist, it's actually rain. There's a bit of rain in between us and them, or well, us and the, that particular mountain. That is also generally on top there where we start our morning safaris. There's a little perch spot that we like to go to that overlooks a lot of the main reserve. And uh, it's a really nice area. Oh, Morgan's just going to quickly wipe the screen, not the screen, the, the lens. Um, it's a really nice area to, to start off the day. Um, because you're elevated, you can see a fair amount of uh, some of the open fields as well as the sound does travel quite nicely up to the top there. So any animals making noises or vocalizations below there, you'll generally be able to hear. And I think, yeah, uh, with with operating on a Makala, you need you need to kind of you need to find the lookout spots in order to be able to find some of the animals sometimes, because th with the thicket so dense in some places, it can be very difficult.
And that is why there are so many nice spots all along the ridge line overlooking the Amakala Basin. Just because, well, the different lookout spots offer different opportunities to spot animals throughout the basin. And, uh, you know, not all the lookout spots will be able to see everything that the other lookout spots might be able to see. Yo, Hannah, uh, the vastness is, I mean, the, the rolling hills, the, the, the shrubbery, the, the spread out in different areas, the open grasslands, it really is something to behold on. The diversity of Amakala, it really is special. It really is special indeed. There we have got our giraffe again, same giraffe. And I'm sorry you lost us earlier. We um we seem to have a small glitch, but the glitch seems to be over now. I'm going to let the giraffe drift off. I'm not going to follow them. It's now getting very dark indeed. And we'll continue on our hopeful way and maybe we'll be lucky with eleven or two. Oh, there they are. Hang on. Let's, let's stay here. Uh, Pedro, you want to know if giraffes, or no, you want to know if elephants practice osteophagia, or the eating of bones, in the same way that giraffes do? I haven't seen them doing it. I feel like I, this should be a really kind of yes or no answer. Do elephants engage in osteophagia? I don't know. I've never seen them do it. They definitely eat sand, so they do engage in geophagia. But I haven't seen them sucking on bands. And we know that giraffe do it. We've seen Nyala do it. Nyala and giraffe are the two main ones that I've seen doing it. But I don't think, I can't recall a time when I've seen an elephant pick up a bean and chew it. What do you say to that, giraffe? She says, I don't need to eat beans at the moment because there are so many delicious green bushes to eat. Many of which are losing their tannins as we go into the autumnal season. There's the bottom of the other one. It is, Maria. A giraffe walking or running is very graceful. They really are spectacularly graceful. Possibly the most graceful out here. Not the most athletic, but definitely the most graceful. It's, they're not athletic because the design just simply doesn't allow for it. And I've made mention fairly frequently of late of how it's possible for these predators to take prey that are heavier than them. For example, a leopardess, you know, mass 35 to 40 kilograms, taking an adult male impala at 70 kilos, or a lioness at 130 kilos, taking an adult female zebra at 300 kilos, so double her mass. And one of the main reasons is that these animals don't have the ability, the herbivores don't have the ability to twist 
their spines and get their legs underneath them if their heads are on their sides on the ground, if you know what I mean. And if you don't know what I mean, go and find a house cat and try and hold it on its side by its head. Uh, you will not succeed. The house cat will get its feet underneath it, stand up, and then probably scratch you. You can try the same with your dog if you like. Um, but with a, an animal like that, or with an animal like a zebra or an impala, if you get them on their sides and hold their heads down, they can't twist enough to get their limbs underneath them to stand up. And it's what makes it one of the reasons that a, a much lighter predator can, can kill them. But for a giraffe, that's taken to extremes. Once you get a giraffe actually on its side, it will almost, it will frequently die without you having to do anything to it. Because they just cannot stand up. They cannot get their legs underneath them. So unless they get an amazing purchase with their feet, they can't actually get themselves up. Now remember everybody, the town hall in uh, about an hour's time, Andre, chairman and CEO, will be talking with me and you about our fundraise, about the future. Our fundraise has so far seen us raise $180,000, which is, I mean, that's an astonishing sum of money. Um, but it does, it is an incredibly expensive business to be running. And so we, I mean, if we could hit 200 by the end of today, that would be absolutely amazing and we'd be extremely grateful. We're already extremely grateful. And please do keep signing the petition. Uh, the town hall will be open to everybody. It'll be on every platform that we're on and it will be at seven o'clock. So half an hour, for half an hour after this drive, there'll be a, an episode of The Cat Report, which is really quite fun. If you don't, well, it's fun anyway, but if you don't know some of our older cat characters, uh, you'll enjoy that. And then um, there will be the town hall at seven o'clock. Right, let's go and find out how poor Steve is doing in his tent. I'm sure he's cold and miserable and just couldn't, would love to be out here with us. So cold, so miserable, James. I've actually nearly finished all my tea. I'm in the process of thinking about going and boiling the kettle again. I'm only joking. I've got enough tea to last me the next 25 minutes or so. So, you know, a story about a giraffe and uh, I think someone asked here about osteophagy and the eating of bones. A friend of mine and a guide had a guest who was terrified of giraffe because she... Uh, she thought giraffe were these long-necked animals that pluck people out of the back of safari vehicles. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a thought. You know, you might think that. They are herbivores, but they do eat bone from time to time for their calcium need. And so he was telling his guest, no, 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 the whole long story about how giraffe are herbivores. And he didn't say any of the jokes about how they pluck things. Like, no, it was all very real. They eat bones for this reason, blah, blah, blah. And... Then, um, same guest, he drives around the corner, and there was a giraffe that had this entire animal leg bone about this long sticking out of its mouth. The guest didn't quite believe him anymore and had a bit of a panic attack at the fact that there was this massive giraffe with a bone, almost like Garfield taking the fish and pulling out all the bones. It was like that sort of moment. And he'd just been detailing that, no, they don't eat other animals. And then they saw that. Anyway, rather funny. But everyone, we've been having a lovely afternoon with some elephant interactions on the um, on the PC here. I've got another one from a decoy from last year. Another one just to to highlight what you can do if you find yourself a watering hole and you see the elephants coming in and doing their thing. I'm going to talk us through that again as well. Uh, I'm going to push play over here. Now this is Skorkor pan. I had lots of good value at this pan. Um, this is something you're going to see elephants do. They're going to come down to water points. They're going to mud wallow. They're going to drink. It's a very social time. Now at no point are these animals going to be like this, doing what they're doing, and suddenly, out of nowhere, with you being there already for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, suddenly switch their behavior and become aggressive towards you. That's not going to happen. Even that mother there with that little baby, look at that. 
she is going to go and rub herself the baby wants to suckle there's lots of communication happening here amongst the herd lots of talking lots of splashing lots of rubbing and these are moments to just sit back and enjoy um, and if they come closer towards you breathe don't have that panic moment of like why are they coming closer towards me well maybe there's some more mud closer to you that they feel that they want to access maybe there's another pool that they want to have access to but just the behavior of them there's even more coming in from the background they just kept streaming in here's a youngster who's starting to walk towards the car and I don't suddenly think oh aggressive behavior let's quickly send you over to James Here is a <laughs> here's a piece of grass, behind which is a white-tailed mongoose. It's literally just stepped behind that piece of grass, and it's it's quite relaxed. Uh, let me go forward a bit, BK, and let's see if we can see it again. Uh, can you see where it went? In there. Shall I stop here? say when Jarrett thinks he's got it there it is <laughs> it's miles ahead look it's standing up there it is it was standing up It's trying to smell us. BK, did you put on some interesting aftershave? Well, you can see why it's called it. Oh dear, it's doing some anal pasting. You can see why it's called a white tailed mongoose. Let's continue. <laughs> What a smell. Well, that was nice to see. We'll see if we can catch up with it. Just a little bit further up the hill. Is that it on the side though? Was that a no. no? It's on. It's on the clearing. It's miles ahead of us. Uh, Kevin, are they the largest mongoose species? They're the largest mongoose species we get here. Are they the largest? I think they might be. You know, I can't think of a bigger one. Oh, there's your. No, that's water. Never mind. Did you see it running? There, there it is. Can you see it there? Running at high speed. There it is. Ooh, maybe it's chasing something. Maybe it's found a rot. It's found something to eat. Show us. I don't think it's a, a rodent. I think it's probably smaller. It may be a little emergence of beetles that have come out because the ground is a bit softer.
this is very cool. Welcome back to those of you who have just rejoined us. We are sitting with our mangusta, who has found an emergence, I think, of some sort of invertebrate on this patch of grass and sand. And is enjoying a Sunday evening feast. Yum, yum. Hmm. And Jarrett just confirming that he thinks that the white-tailed, well, not he thinks, I'm pretty sure he's just looked it up, and that the white-tailed mongoose, who's just anal pasted there, is the biggest mongoose, followed by the Egyptian mongoose, which we don't get here. Guess where the Egyptian mongoose is found, BK? Uh, sounds like Egypt. Yes, it is, yeah, among other places, but certainly to be found on the Nile. How did you know? You've been studying, have you? Yeah, maybe, yeah. 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 Good man. I think let's just keep watching this little one for a while. How far away do you reckon it is now? Do you want to go a bit closer? I think it's quite relaxed at the moment. So just, we'll just go to the other side of this puddle. Yeah, still there. I won't push it too hard. Let's stop there. So it will eat anything made of meat. A lot of carnivores do. A lot of carnivorous birds and reptiles and mammals will eat basically anything that they can overpower. But this chap will eat a lot of reptiles, insects, eggs, definitely snakes, frogs, if it can find them. Could have been, yeah, could have found a couple of frogs coming out of the sand. Rodents, if it can catch them. Now, there's definitely some emergence going on here in the sand. It is very tasty and exciting to the white-tailed mangusta. Mmm. Craig, the only two social mongoose species here are the dwarf and the banded and they hang together because they're smaller basically i'm pretty sure that's the reason in the same for the same it, they use safety in numbers they have a different sort of social structure and they're diurnal also and i think a whole group of them running around in the day or in the night would probably be very obvious to predators so they don't I think it's it's got to do with trying to stay hidden. Yeah, that chap's gone now. All right, let's continue. Just going to go back down towards the waterhole where we started and see if those lions haven't popped up. Erin, that's a very um, biologically sort of correct question. Are all Oh, Mellas mongoose. Oh, Mellas mongoose solitary. Yes, they are. I think they may sometimes occur in pairs if they're mating or if Mama Mellas mongoose has got some babies. Oh, are they all meso carnivores? Yes, mongoose. Are they all meso carnivores? As far as I'm aware, yes, they are. Sorry, missed your question there. No. Are all meso carnivores solitary? No, because we've just, as we've just discussed, um, the there are social mongoose um, or mongooses, but yes, the majority are, I suppose. The majority would be. There are some, there are some impalas. 
Would you like to cast a, a infrared light on them, BK? Just for excitement's sake. You seen any lions? So a, a meso carnivore, for those of you who are wondering, it doesn't, that's not what those impala are. A meso carnivore is largely a carnivore, but it also eats uh, bits of fruit and that sort of thing. And uh, so that would include things like civets, uh, I suppose, perhaps some of the mustelids, like, I mean, badgers would eat almost exclusively meat, but some of the weasels maybe, um, skunks, and then some of the mongoose will eat a bit of fruit, but most of the mongoose out here are largely fully carnivorous. Jackals, good one. Um, they are, some jackals are meso-carnivores, and they're not all solitary, no. That was a very nice question. Very, very nice. Thank you for that. Well, thanks. And a very good question, James. Music carnivores. I think we often don't elaborate on them too much. Uh, nice to hear the good explanation there. So everyone, we got pulled away from our wonderful elephant video before. So I'm going to keep playing it because it only gets better. I'm going to keep playing it from exactly where I left off with this one cheeky youngster sort of seemingly coming a little bit closer. There we go, giving a head shake. That's uh, what elephants do when they're a bit distressed or a bit annoyed with the world. But when you're a young elephant, it doesn't really mean much. There that... Uh, bull has moved over, pushed the female out the way. It's his turn now to go play with the rubbing post. You see how that female moved off and is showing his shoulder, showing him her shoulder. She doesn't want to get involved with him, but he's really not interested in her. He's interested in what that log can do for him. So all of these behaviors, everyone, are 100% enjoyable. The elephant's are charging right now you can see this youngster's coming close to the car it's getting quite <laughs> playful these behaviors are all so wonderful to witness and as i said if these elephants start coming closer and closer and closer their behavior from the beginning of the scene has been very obvious it's been very clear that everybody's relaxed and everyone is in a very comfortable position um, for them to come closer to you and change the behavior is unlikely. Slowly but surely, with eyes semi-closed, the youngsters, apart from the adults, are coming closer and closer. This actually might be a young female here who's going to come introduce her little baby to us. First going to push that one out of the way. And now the whole family is coming across ever closer And it's playtime in the sunshine. So if you ever find yourself at a watering hole and elephants are doing this, don't do anything. There's no point in driving away. There's no point in starting your car. There's no point in, in leaving the scene at all. Just sit back, breathe, and enjoy. Oh, I pushed stop when I should have pushed pause. Okay, there we are back where we were. Now you can see this one in the middle is kind of showing a little bit of uncertainty, suddenly realizing that, hang on, what's going on? Where did this car come from? Is everything all right? Oh yes, everything is 
just fine. Everything is absolutely fine. Oh, Geraldine, it's been my pleasure. A lot of these clips we would have done live when I was doing live at the water, not live at the water. Oh, what were we doing in the days, Chat? Do you remember? What were they uh, called? Something nature. On. Can't remember. Spent the whole day out. I'd spend the entire day at a pan like this, just enjoying elephants and a scorkel pan for the win. What a treat. Escape. Thanks, Jared. Um, I'm sure you, you should know. I think I've lost it from my memory. But such special time spending time with elephants. I'm glad we could revisit it. And I'm glad I could show you over again. I, mean, I guess it depends on... Do you know... Um, hello, everyone. Sorry, that got us in a bit of a shock. We were discussing what books BK should read. I was about to sort of question him a bit on, he wants some sort of thriller type book. Um, BK, I'm going to suggest if you really want to try something South African, Dion Mayer. I mean, obviously you should read A Year in the Wild, Back to the Bush and Return to the Wild by James Hendry. They are, they're, they're excellent books. You know, I know the author personally. Yeah, he's a bit of a chop, but um, but he, he he writes okay. So you should you should check out his books. Um, if you'd like a copy, I'll speak to him and see if he can sign you one. Yes. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, Dion Mayer is very good. Yeah. We're now very close to camp, everyone. I need to sort of be in camp at the end of drive to prepare myself for the down haul, which will take place in uh, 25 minutes. 35 minutes, 35 minutes. So I'm going to drive incredibly slowly towards the camp. Incredibly slowly. Oh! No, I thought I'd spotted a chameleon. I have not. Let's see if we can get a chameleon before the end of drive. I must say, I think, considering how foul the weather was when we started, it turned out okay. Pretty decent Mulwati sighting some nice giraffes. We did see some elephants briefly, although they were unhappy. Steve gave us... I, I'm really most impressed that he managed to find all of those clips. So, I mean, that's really great that he did that. And then poor the dreadlock twins down in... <laughs> the, the dreadlock twins down at Amakala also did a superb job and made a superb effort to be out in what are very trying conditions. I'm not sure that I would call them the dreadlock twins to their faces. They are both bigger than I am. They both have good senses of humour, however, so they probably find it quite amusing. Three minutes. Jared, I really am going to struggle to extend this drive for another three minutes. I mean, we're pretty much in camp. We're going to need to <laughs> we're going to need to find something like a chameleon. Ah, Jarrett says he's had a bit of a panic because he saw the turn. We can have a look uh, at the flower that we ended with, and I actually meant to check whether Judy H. Oh, we're going to get no colour. Well, I think we're going to have to come out of infrared quickly, Jarrett, if you don't mind, so that we can get some colour because they're bright yellow, and. Um, Judy H, I'm just wondering if she sent me about this Senna and whether or not it's a Senna Paticiana or another kind of a Senna. Do you think Twitter will work for me now? No, it won't. Cannot retrieve tweets at this time. Well, Elon, a pox on you and your app. Oh, was one allowed to say that? I'm not sure. Yes, here we go. Hang on, wait. Uh, Judy, did you send me a message? Did you at me? Sorry, I'm struggling to retrieve my tweets. 
No, I don't think she did. Right, Senna Petitiana, it's going to remain for now. Good. Well, that's a very nice colour to end off with after a black and white drive, after a very grey drive with all the grey clouds. And now we can drift slowly down towards Camp Biko. You can leave it in colour because I think it's unlikely we're going to go and spot a leopard as we go into camp, but it's not impossible. Sixty seconds left. So we will see you at seven o'clock for the town hall, please, on all platforms. Everybody's welcome. Bring your questions, we'll do our best to answer them and keep you abreast of developments here at Wild Earth. Swinging round towards the garage with 30 seconds, 30 to go. <laughs> Very nice. Good way to end. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jared. Thanks, everybody, for braving the elements with us. It's been lovely to be with you this afternoon. I was not looking forward to it when we went out, and I had a wonderful time. So thanks for having us, and thanks for being with us. We will see you at 7 o'clock at the Town Hall. Until then, bye-bye. In two magical African wilderness areas, the Masai Mara in Kenya and the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa, five expert safari guides follow a cast of compelling animal characters and the never